Good evening. We'll go ahead and get started. So this is, uh, I believe, the third class uh, where we're studying the debate book from 1946. Uh, Guy in Woods debated A.U. Nunnery, um, and it was a four-day debate. The first two days were on baptism and whether it's for the remission of sins or not, what the Scripture teaches. The second uh, two days were on uh, apostasy. Uh, can a person fall away from grace or become a Christian and then fall away? Um, so the first Tuesday went over some background material. Uh, the second one, we talked about uh, some of Guy and Wood's affirmative arguments. So the person that's in the affirmative is the one making the case. So Guy and Wood's started uh, on, I believe it was a Tuesday morning, and taught that the Bible teaches water baptism is essential to the salvation of the alien sinner. Okay? So alien just means someone who's not a Christian. Okay? Um, so last Tuesday, we talked about one or two of his opening arguments. We talked about how he defined his terms. Uh, he established that all have sinned, and that sin is what separates us from God. Okay? Um, then we talked about baptism is a part of the law that God has chosen for a person to be forgiven of their sins. Um, we talked about the six times in the New Testament that baptism and salvation are mentioned together. There are six of those. Do you guys remember how many out of six? baptism preceded salvation? All of them. Six out of six times, okay? That was Mark 1, 2, Luke 3, 3, Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, 16, and 1 Peter 3, 21. If you need a list of those, uh, we can get those to you. Um, then we got into one of his main arguments. We talked about how there is no power in water, okay? Sometimes people will say, well, how does water have anything to do with cleansing of sins? It's what God chose, we looked at uh, the examples in the Old Testament of Naaman. All right, Naaman was told to dip seven times in what river? The Jordan. And when he dipped seven times, what happened to his leprosy? He was cleansed. Was the power in the water? That's right, the power was in God. God just chose to, to uh, bless the promise that he made to Naaman whenever his faith moved him to be, ba to, uh, be immersed seven times in the Jordan. Uh, we talked about how God used the Red Sea in Exodus 14, 13 as an instrument to save Israel. We talked about the brazen serpent in Numbers 21, how God used it, right? That sounds a little odd, doesn't it? To be saved, you're supposed to look on a serpent. Was there any power inherent in the serpent? No. It was whenever their faith moved them to obey, that's whenever God blessed them, okay? So um, at the very end of class, uh, I read a quote that we're going to pick up with, and that was Guy and Wood said this, Mr. Nunnery, that was his opponent, will likely introduce numerous passages conditioning salvation on faith. I would like to suggest to you a very common figure of speech, a characteristic of the sacred writers, to make one condition of pardon stand for all of them. Okay? So there are many times in Scripture where maybe belief is only mentioned. Okay? Now, maybe there's another one where it says repentance is mentioned. Uh, I think it's Acts 11.18, repentance unto life. Does that mean repentance is the only condition necessary? No, okay? So that's a figure of speech that Guy and Woods um, referenced. He then used John 3, 16. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. In that, symbol, that simple verse, what's, what is the condition mentioned? Just belief, right? Now from the context, summarize, what is the context of John 3, 3, or John chapter, I gave it away. John chapter 3 and verse 16. Jesus says, you believe, okay, believeth, that's present tense, keep on believing the things that I'm teaching. What had he just got done teaching earlier in that chapter? A man must be born of what? Water and the Spirit, okay? So um, you always want to look at the context. 10 verses, 20 verses before, and 20 verses after, okay? Okay. Um, so the second argument, this is what Guy and Woods, this is where we're, we're going to pick up. He read Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, which says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. All right. So does the Bible, does the New Testament teach that we're justified by faith? Yes. We're justified by what type of faith? Obedient faith, the system of faith. All right. Um, the word faith is used a lot of times in the New Testament. We may have talked about this the very first class, but just quickly we'll recount it. Um, for instance, uh, the Bible in Mark 16, 16, he that, what, believes 
and is baptized. Do you know uh, in the, the Greek language, do you know what believe in English and faith in English have in common? Same root word, all right? So when you see believe in your Bible and faith in your Bible, it's the same root word in Greek, all right? So it's one word. Sometimes we see belief and faith and we think it's two completely different things. It just depends on the way the translators pick it, all right? So it's, sometimes it's a believe if it's a verb and faith is if it's a noun, all right? Um, so justified by faith, okay? You have peace with God. Uh, this is what Guy and Wood said. He said, this verse lists only faith. Repentance is not mentioned. Faith here is made to stand for all the condi conditions. Obviously, here it is not faith alone, for that would exclude repentance. Okay? If you have a lot of conversations with people about what they need to do to be saved, be prepared for this tactic. Okay? Um, I hear it every single week, which is Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 says we're justified by faith. Not by faith and what? Baptism is what they say. It's the argument. They say, I'm justified. Romans 5.1, we're justified by faith. It doesn't say by faith and baptism, right? What is a part of the system of faith? Baptism, okay? And that's what Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, the context is. He's just got done in Romans 4, talking about Abraham being justified before what was even invented. What were the uh, Judaizing teachers trying to bind on people? Circumcision. That's right. So in Romans 4, he says, you're justified by faith, the system of faith, not by the law of Moses with circumcision. Okay? Um, um, the key is when is a person justified by faith. All right? Paul there in Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. When was Paul justified? When would his faith justify him? just as if he'd never sinned. When were his sins forgiven? That's right. Let's, let's look really quickly at when Paul was justified. Uh, let's go to Acts chapter 22. This is a passage we looked at last week, but I just want to take a look at it. Acts 22 and verse 16. When you look through a lot of Paul's epistles, right? We, we've said this before, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, the good news, written about the life of who? Christ, written so that you will believe on him and that by believing you have life through his name. Book of Acts tells you how to become a what? Christian, talks about the foundation, the history of the church. Uh, Romans through Revelation are all written to who? Christians, right? So if you go to Romans 5, 1, and Paul says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. He's teaching the Romans they were justified in what? The same way who was? Paul was, right? Do you think Paul would teach the Romans to become a Christian one way and he became a Christian a different way? No. That's something to remember, too, when you look in Ephesians, uh, Philippians. A lot of these where Paul talks about their salvation, their justification, he always uses we, or us, okay? So let's look at how Paul uh, became a Christian in Acts 22. Um, in Acts 9, do you guys remember some of the things he did? He met who on the road? Jesus. In Acts 9, 6, he said to Jesus, he said, what must I do? And Jesus says, go to the city, you'll be told what you must do. Acts chapter 9 and verse 9, do you remember what he didn't do for three days? He didn't eat or drink. So for three days... Paul felt so bad about something, he wouldn't eat or drink for three days. Uh, Acts chapter 9 and verse 11, when uh, the Lord Jesus is talking to Ananias, he says that there's a man, uh, he's at the, at the house, and he is, behold, he is what? Praying, okay? So he, wouldn't, he didn't eat or drink for three days, he's at this house, and he's praying, okay? All the things that the world would tell us, Paul's already saved, right? Acts twenty two sixteen. This is Ananias speaking to Paul. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Okay? So I know we looked at this verse last week, but I just repetition is a key to learning. Whenever somebody shows you a passage that Paul was the writer that's referencing justification or salvation, all the Bible words for having sins forgiven, if it's Paul, remember that that's how Paul had his sins forgiven. Okay? Um, so then Guy and Woods is going to say not all conditions are mentioned in every account. Okay? Let's look at a couple of those. Uh, we're already in the book of Acts. Go to Acts 11.18.
Okay, so Acts eleven eighteen, the context. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius' household. Acts chapter 11 is when uh, they are recounting the things in order. They're explaining to the Jewish people why they went and ate and taught and spent time with the Gentiles. They say, why did you go and spend time with these men? They're uncircumcised. And so in Acts 11, he recounts it in order. Look at Acts eleven eighteen. When they heard these things, they became silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. So repentance unto life, right? Is, is belief mentioned in this passage, this particular verse? No? It's confession? So what's the, what's the only, thank you, what's the only condition mentioned here unto life? What? Repentance, right? Baptism is not mentioned, right? Get used to that. It's okay. You don't have to be nervous when somebody says, well, this verse says repentance, doesn't say baptism. Don't let that kind of make you nervous. That's okay. That doesn't, it doesn't have to say that every place, right? Let's look at uh, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. I would get very comfortable going to this verse and answering this one. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Okay, so this, I want to, this quickly, the context of Romans 10. Romans 9 through 11 is Paul talking about how he wishes that the Israelites according to the flesh, the Jew, his Jewish brethren, would stop rejecting the gospel and obey it and become Christians, right? Now, in chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, he talks about how the Jewish people have a zeal for God, but it's not according to what? Knowledge. He basically says they establish their own righteousness instead of following what God said to do, okay? And so then he starts talking about the Jewish brethren, and then if you get down to verse 9, I'm sure you've heard this one, but let's read it. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart he has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Okay, so somebody says, Aaron, it says that with my mouth I confess, I believe and I confess unto salvation, right? Now is this the whole plan of salvation in one verse or two verses? Okay, what else isn't mentioned here? Let's not even go to baptism right now. Baptism's not here, but what, other, what else is not mentioned here? Repentance, right? If you like to write notes in your Bible, I would write that down. If you write, I would write, repentance not mentioned. Because right now, it may seem pretty common to you, you understand it, but if somebody takes you to this verse later, and you have repentance there, it might help a little bit, all right? Um, I want to say this. So I'm not... Um, I, I understand why certain newer translations translate certain passages a certain way. Um, I don't think the English Standard is a horrible translation. Um, I have it as a backup, but I want to be careful. This verse particularly, the English Standard, I do not believe, uh, with my limited knowledge, does a good job of translating this. Um, the English Standard uh, changes, I think I have a slide a little bit later, the English Standard changes this verse quite a bit. Um, the English Standard says believes and is justified, confesses and is saved, okay? That's not, what the verse, that's not what the verse teaches. It says what? You believe what? Unto. Not you believe and you are. You believe unto. It's directional, okay? The ESV, I actually think, even contradicts itself. Um, if, you, if this isn't maybe making a whole lot of sense, you can always go look this up and compare the translations. But the ESV says you believe and is justified. If you're justified, what does that mean has happened to your sins? They've been forgiven. So I believe and I'm justified, but then it says I confess and I'm saved. Which one is it? Am I saved after I believe or after I confess? Right? It changes... Well, ju justification and salvation, they're really the same two things, yeah. So what it's saying is it's saying you believe and you're saved, but then, if I'm paraphrasing, you believe and you're saved, then you confess and you're saved. Well, if I am saved when I believe, I don't need to confess, right? It's setting up a process. 
So I don't think the ESV does a very good job if you come across that in this verse. The word means unto. So I believe unto justification. I'm approaching it. I confess unto. And then if you look in Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, what does Romans 10, 13 say? Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What did we talk about last week? What, what was Paul told to do to call on the name of the Lord? Be baptized. That's right. So I think when someone says baptism is not in Romans 10, I go right to verse 13. I think that's referencing baptism. Uh, because calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's actually a reference to Joel 2.32, which is what Peter quoted in Acts, in Acts 2.21. Um, so confession is mentioned there. Belief in confession, but not repentance, right? That's probably an easier way to handle that passage. You just say, well, repentance isn't mentioned, okay? Um, then Guy and Woods talks about 1 Peter 3.21. Baptism does also now what? Save us. Wood said, if I were to teach baptism alone saves, then what, would that be honest if he said baptism alone saves? No. He says, if I were to teach baptism alone saves, then I would be doing the same thing that the faith alone advocates do. Right? Just once again, when someone says you're saved by faith alone, they do not mean, when you hear that, they don't mean the gospel alone, the system of faith. They mean belief alone apart from anything else. Okay? That when you hear faith alone, that's what the faith alone doctrine is trying to get at. Okay? So he said, if I were to say 1 Peter 3.21, baptism now saves us, therefore all you have to do to be baptized, is, uh, all you have to do to be saved is be baptized, that would be what? Dishonest. All right? It's hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized. But sometimes you have one that represents the whole. Okay? Then he said, by the same door that nunnery brings in repentance, I will bring in baptism. That's what he said. He said, many passages give belief, but repentance is not mentioned, but it is added. Now, has anybody um, heard an objection? What do some people say belief and repentance are? It's two words. Inseparable. Has anybody heard this before? They'll say belief and, baptiz- or belief and repentance are inseparable graces. Has anybody ever heard that? What they try to say is this is really a way they try to get around the idea of you say, well, repentance isn't in that verse. And they'll say, well, yeah, it's implied. And you'll say, well, why? And they'll say, well, be- uh, repentance and belief are inseparable graces. What they mean by that is they mean anytime belief is there, if you believe, you'll repent. And if you repent, you had to have believed. That's kind of the logic, right? I could use the same logic and say, well, if you really believe, you'll be baptized. And if you're baptized, you really were b- you believed, right? But that's what they'll try to say. Now, let's go to Acts 2 really quickly. Um, That's, so the next, the next thing I had was, uh, is there any examples of anyone in the New Testament that believed but didn't obey? And he hit the nail on the head. He said the demons believe, right? Who, who else in the New Testament does the Bible say that believed but wouldn't go further? They wouldn't confess because they loved? That's right. John chapter 12. They believed, but because of the fear of the Jews, the Pharisees, the synagogue, they wouldn't confess him because they were afraid of getting thrown out of the synagogue. That's right. So in Acts chapter 2, um, we want to look at our belief and repentance in separable graces. Okay? What that means is, can somebody believe and have not repented yet? What do we see in Acts chapter 2? That's right. Were these people believers already? They were believers because he just got them preaching about the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And they said, okay, what do we do? Do you think they were believers? They weren't. That's right. That's exactly right. And so they're already believers, and they say, what shall we do? And what are they told? Well, just be baptized because repentance and belief are inseparable graces. So if you believe, you've already repented. No, that's not what they're told. If you believe, they're commanded to do what? repent and be baptized. And verse 41 says that those that gladly received his word were baptized. What does that mean? If there were some that gladly received his word, what does that probably imply there were some that didn't? That's right. And that's what we see in James 2.19 and in, uh, in John 12.32, I think it is, where they believed, the demons believed, James 2.19, I believe, and uh, John 12, where they believed, but they wouldn't confess. Okay? All right. Salvation is by faith, but not by faith, what? Alone. Okay. 
That's, I think it's so important to just, you're probably saying, Aaron, this is annoying, I know this, but I'm just saying it again. The Bible teaches that we are saved by faith, okay? But not by a type of faith that's not obedient. Does that make sense? Or did I explain that well? Okay, we've, me and Jamie have talked about the wording thing, certain ways. Okay. This guy in Wood said, faith includes acts of obedience, and then he used Hebrews 11 as a basis for this. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Wood said, faith is always followed by an action word. Faith only produces the blessing when it's conjoined with obedience. Um, so he says, in this chapter, you have faith followed by an action word. They did something, okay? Um, so we'll look at these. And then he says that faith only produces the blessing when it's conjoined with obedience. Thayer's, which is the Greek dictionary, it actually, under the word belief or faith, it says uh, a belief conjoined with obedience, Right? So if, uh, if your parent tells you to go clean your room and you say, do you believe me? And they say, yes, but they don't go clean it. Then what are they obviously not doing? They might have a mental assent. They might understand what you're saying, but they're not really obe- not being obedient. Okay? All right, so let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abraham what? This is verse 8. Abraham obeyed. Okay? That's referencing his call in Genesis chapter 12. All right? Look at, um, let's go down to by verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, what? Offered. Okay? Verb. He did something. It wasn't just simple belief and he didn't follow it up with anything. Um, let's go to verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, did what? Refused. He took action. Okay? He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Um, let's go to verse 30. This is one of my favorites. Okay? This is one of my go-tos that, for whatever reason, always comes into my mind. A lot of times people will say, well, if you have to do anything or be obedient, that that's, you're somehow working, right? It's not a gift anymore. That's what people will say. They'll say, the Bible says salvation is by grace through faith. It's a gift. It's not earned. It's the gift of God. So if you have to do anything to get it, then you, it's not of faith. That's what the argument would be, okay? Let's look at Hebrews 11.30. By faith... The walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. So by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. Do you remember what happened in Joshua chapter 6? What did they have to do? Let's, that's right. Go, let's go back to Joshua chapter 6 really quickly. This is one of my favorites because there's a, there's a particular set of words that's used here. Joshua chapter 6. Okay, Joshua chapter 6 and verse 2. Joshua 6, 2. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have what? Given. I've given Jericho into your hand. So Jericho is a what from God? Yeah, what you, a gift is what you give, right? So God says, hey, this is a gift. I've given you Jericho. And then what does God say after that? Does he say there's any requirement, there's any conditions on that to, be, to receive that gift? That's right. I've given Jericho into your hand, its king, and all the mighty men of valor. Verse 3, you shall march around the city. Right? So what do they do? Are they obedient? They march around the city, and what happens to the walls? They fall down. In Hebrews 11.30 says, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down. So God says, Joshua, I'm giving you a city. It's a gift, but you have to do what to receive it? You have to be obedient to the commands. Is that not the exact same thing with the New Testament salvation? Salvation is by grace, God's grace, through faith. But how do we receive the promise through faith? We have to be what? Obedient. We have to be obedient to the commands, all right? Um, so after Guy and Woods talks about salvation is by faith, but not by faith alone, he uses Hebrews 11. And then he talks about a passage we've talked about quite a few times, which is Galatians chapter 3. 26 and 27. It says they were children by faith in Christ 
because as many of them has had been baptized into Christ, had put on Christ. Okay? Um, let's go to John chapter 1, 11 and 12. If you've got any comments, throw your hand up. John chapter 1. All right, John chapter 1 and verse 11. He came to his own. His own did not receive him. It's talking about Jesus, okay? Verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So this verse says when you believe in his name, then you have the what? The right to what? Become a child of God. So does that say once you believe, you already are a child of God? No, it says whenever you believe, as many as him received him, those who believed on him were given the what? The right to become, that's right, the right to become a child of God. That's what Galatians talks about. They had the right if they believed, but they didn't become a child of God until they did what God said to do. Okay? These are all the affirmatives. You may say, Aaron, this is pretty repetitive. That's exactly what Guy and Woods is trying to do. He's trying to lay down a whole series of arguments so that the listener, maybe one sticks better than another. One person hears and says, I don't really think that's a very good argument. Well, he's laying down four or five of them, okay? He says, John 1.12. Yeah, John 1.12. Then he says, a sinner must turn from their ways to God. And what is that great turning act, okay? In Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, it said, repent and what? Repent and turn, okay? So he goes through a, a series of verses where he shows that the turning act is not all of the other ones. He says, you know, Acts 11.21, a great number believed and turned. So if they believed and turned, then turning is not what? In this verse. It's not believing. So if you have to believe and turn, then turning is not believing. You wouldn't say you have to believe and believe, right? So he, he takes the turning action and says it's not belief. Then he says turning is not repentance. Well, Acts 3.19 says repent and what? Repent and turn. Okay. This will come together, I think, here in a second. He says, turning is not repentance, Acts 26, 20. And so he says, what do you think repent and turn is? If it's not repentance and it's not belief, what do you think, what do you think he means when he says repent and turn, that your sins may be blotted out, Acts 3, 19? Let's, look at, let's, go, to Acts, let's go to Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Turning is not repentance because in Acts 26.20, 20, it says repent and turn. So if both are mentioned, repentance and turning, if turning was repentance, it would be saying repent and repent. See what I mean? So if we look at a parallel between what Acts 3.19 means and you parallel it with Acts 2.38, you're going to see a, a pretty good parallel. So Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Repent, therefore, and the New King James says be converted. Right? What's the King James say? Repent. The King James? Repent. Okay. Repent, therefore, and be converted. That's the New King James says. Anyone have an ASV? Turn again? Okay. Repent, therefore, and be converted, or turn again. All right, now what does that mean? Let's look at, let's look at these two passages together. Acts 3.19. Repent, therefore, and be converted, or turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. Can you think of a parallel passage that happened just in the chapter before that? Acts 2.38. What's Acts 2.38? Repent, be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 3.19, repent, turn, that your sins may be blotted out. What do you think the turning action is? Yeah, the person turns and they're baptized. Okay, That's another argument Guy and Woods is making. Okay? Um, yeah, well, be convert. I like be converted as far as... Did you say this? Sure. That's even better. He just said that the word that, your sins may be blotted out, is ace, the same Greek word in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for, ace, the remission of your sins. 
to write that one down. It's even better. Good job. Okay, so that's the close of Wood's first affirmative, all right? So if you're thinking, man, I'm, I need a break, that's okay. So you've got Guy in Woods, a guy who's 38 years old, has had 50 debates already. Those are his arguments, okay? So if you're thinking, man, those were deep, Guy in Woods is a Greek scholar. He knows the original language, and those are his arguments, okay? So now you have the close of Woods affirmative, and now Nunnery gets his chance to answer, okay? So you're going to see his answers. In a debate, if one person makes the affirmative, the other one is supposed to answer their arguments. If you're reading the debate book, unfortunately, you know what doesn't happen? He doesn't really answer the arguments in order like you're supposed to. He kind of just almost goes and starts making his arguments, okay? But I want to read you uh, some quotes from the debate book in case you haven't read it so that you can see how this kind of comes across, all right? This is what A.U. Nunnery says. He says this to Guy in Woods. Could Christ save anybody today without you or some preacher like you? If so, how could he do it? If Christ can save anyone today without you, tell us how he can do it. If he can't do it, you're essential to salvation as well as baptism. According to your argument, you are essential. If you are not essential and the other preacher is essential, tell us how you can explain that. He's basically telling Guy in Woods, if your argument's right, it's really shock and awe. That's really what it is. He's trying to intimidate him and say, you're saying that you're essential to salvation, right? Does anybody in this room think they're essential to salvation? No. And that's really what he's trying to get Guy in Woods. He's kind of trying to... Uh, I don't maybe get him to feel a little bit guilty about the argument. Okay, the arguments he's making is true. Oh yeah, A.U. Nunnery said in his first his first response. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah, and there's there's a couple quotes like that in there. I can send you the page numbers. I think it's page fifteen. No, he never did. No, Guy and Woods never said that. No, th that's you're right. So Guy and Woods never said I'm essential. He's saying baptism is essential. And so A.U. Nunnery says, oh, you think you're essential? And guy, he never said that. Because, no. He, what, he, what he's trying to do is he's basically trying to um, make Guy in Woods, it's, really, it's not really based on anything Guy in Woods has said. Uh, it would be the equivalent of, you know, if Tim says you have to be baptized, then I would say, well, Tim, if you have to baptize somebody, then that makes you essential. So are you saying the gospel is according to Tim, that Tim, if Tim's not here, then nobody can be saved? That's really what he's saying. The argument's not really a logical argument. It's more an emotional one. It's a straw man. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Okay. Um, let's see. Then he's going to go to Acts chapter 16. Let's go to Acts 16. You guys are doing great. Doing great. I know this is a little tedious sometimes. You get used to these arguments, though, and you're going to be fine. Right, Jamie? Ask Jamie a question about this. See if she hasn't had it beaten into her brain. Not now. I'm talking about in conversation. Don't worry. I'm not asking you. All right. Acts chapter 16. All right. Acts chapter 16. Let's pick up in, uh, in verse... Uh, let's go 29. Okay. Context is Paul is in prison. They're singing hymns and praying at midnight. There's an earthquake. The, the doors open up, and the soldier is about to do what to himself? Kill himself. Why? He thinks he lost the prisoners. Do you know what happens to you if you're a Roman soldier and you lose your prisoners? Yeah, they take care of you. That's an incentive not to lose your prisoners. So he's about to kill himself because he's probably thinking, I'd rather kill myself than be tortured and then killed. And so let's pick up in verse uh, 29. He called for a light ran in and fell down trembling. This is the Philippian jailer. He fell down trembling before Paul and Cyrus. Silas, Cyrus, that's the wrong book, it's Isaiah. Verse 30, he brought them out, the Philippian jailer brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, so they said, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. That's where the argument stops in the debate. And this is what his quote is. He says, I want to ask my friend Woods one question. I want to know, would he act or speak like the apostles in Acts 16, 30, and 31? When the direct question was asked by a trembling sinner, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then, this is the quote I have bolded. This is what Nunnery said. Now, he didn't do anything else but believe. That's what Nunnery said. He said, these guys didn't do anything but believe. What's the problem with stopping at verse 31? There's more. 
There's a billboard. I've seen a couple of billboards all over the country that you're driving down the interstate, and it says, Acts 16.30, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, believe. Right? One called 855 Truth. You can call them. They're an organization in Ohio, and I asked them why they didn't put the rest of the verse on the billboard. Right? Let's keep reading. See what the rest of it is. So verse 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Verse 32, then they what? Spoke the what? Spoke the word of the Lord to him. So he didn't even know what to believe yet. Okay, it's the equivalent of saying, hey, you want to be saved? You have to believe on Jesus. Okay, okay, what do I do? Okay, now I need to teach you, right? They didn't even know what to believe yet. If that man's saved in Acts 16.31, he's saved before he even has faith. He hasn't been taught yet, okay? So Acts 16.32, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all that were in his house. Verse 33, he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, all right? The stripes are likely the wounds on their back, probably dried blood from being whipped or scourged or however they interrogated them. Okay, it's the middle of the night. It's midnight. What do you think washing their stripes? It shows that the Philippian jailer is what? Repentant. He's penitent. He feels bad that these guys have been whipped. Okay, so you see his, they say believe, then they teach him. So he believes. Okay, he's showing penitence by washing their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were what? Baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. So it says, having believed. I think that's perfect tense. Don't quote me on that. But So basically, after he's believed and baptized, it says, having believed. Referencing back, okay? Now, here's another point to note from this. Number one, this thing where he says, he didn't do anything else but believe. Is that accurate? No, of course it's not accurate. They got half the story, Okay. Would God have told the truth when he said he'll be saved without any other conditions? That's what Nunnery said. Did God say there were no other conditions? No. He said believe. Believing includes believing what? Everything being taught. Okay. If he met the condition, that's what Nunnery said, to be saved, then God would have told the truth. Okay. Here, let's, there's another point in this in Acts chapter 16. What hour of the night did they take them and baptize them? Midnight. Why? Why, why not wait till the next day? That's exactly right. When you look in our world today, you'll see different things. And I don't mean this to be, to be um, it, it's, it's the truth. That's why I'm saying it. I don't mean it to be, to beat down anybody else. But the truth is, when you see a church that says we're having a baptism Sunday, where they schedule it out, right? We had a man in uh, Virginia that uh, saw a video online called... And he said, hey, I saw you talking about, it was on one of the Instagram videos, I saw you talking about how nobody in the Bible, no one had a baptism Sunday, and we had a conversation. He had called to be baptized at a, a, a denominational church, and they said, oh, great, we baptize once a quarter, we'll put you on our list. And he asked why they did that, right? In the New Testament, how long did they wait to baptize somebody? They didn't wait. You know why they didn't wait? Because in the New Testament, they understood that you needed to be baptized to have what forgiven? your sins. That's why the jailer and they baptized him in the middle of the night. They didn't want to wait till the next weekend because what happens if he dies in that interim, right? As soon as you disconnect the New Testament purpose for baptism, which is remission of sins, if you disconnect that baptism and the remission of sins, you disconnect them, then you understand why churches will schedule a baptism Sunday or why there's no urgency. You know, they all will baptize you next week, right? Because they think sins have been forgiven before baptism, right? That's not what the New Testament teaches, all right? They interrupted Peter in Acts chapter 2. I'm sure if Robert was preaching and somebody just walked down front and said, you've you got to stop, you've got to baptize me right now, I'm sure he'd probably just baptize him. Yeah. Um, I remember one time when we went to Africa and we got a guy who emailed us and he said, Brother, we're so excited for it. Now, the churches in Africa, they're growing. Okay? You have some that are less mature. And somebody said, Brother, we're so excited for you to be here. We have like seven or eight people that want to be baptized. We said, no, go baptize them right now. Don't wait for us. That's, so we have to be careful. We don't fi- fall into the same mindset. You know, if somebody tells you they want to be baptized, when do you baptize them? Right now, all right? My wife wouldn't even wait on me. She called me. I was in West Virginia, and she said, I need to be, I'm going to be baptized. I said, that's great. I'm six hours away. When are you doing it? She said, right now. I'm not waiting on you. I said, that's the best answer you could have you given, all right? Okay. 
He says, Acts 16.30. He says, would Woods answer the question like the apostles did in Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31? What's the answer? Well, Guy and Woods would answer it like the apostles did. He just answered it with half of what the apostles did. He didn't give the whole story, okay? Then he says, uh, what about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the patriarchs? What became of them before this doctrine of baptismal salvation? All right? So he says, what about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? All right, what about them? That's right. They lived under what system? The patriarchal system. All right? Was the patriarchal system, was the command, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved under the patriarchal system? No. Now, they were saved by faith, right? Hebrews 11 says they were. Now, were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were they saved? Was Abraham saved when he started his initial relationship with God by circumcision? No. Abraham's initial call was in Genesis 12. Circumcision was given what? Five chapters later, in Genesis chapter 17. Okay? People under the law of Moses, were they saved by faith? Yep. With the conditions that they were given. Right? We think about the thief on the cross, Luke chapter 23. Right? Luke chapter 23, Luke chapter 24 is where you find out about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And then after that is when Jesus gave what? Great commission. Okay? Good job. All in hell without baptism? Well, we know that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not going to be in hell. Matthew 8, 11 says that. Okay? Uh, then he says, If we are children of God by faith in Christ, then we are not children of God by baptism. We can't be children by baptism and by faith. What's he doing? He's separating them again, all right? That's right. He's saying baptism and faith are two separate things. So if you're saved by faith, you can't be saved by baptism, right? You see that some of these arguments, they start to get a little bit repetitious, right? You're saying, well, Aaron, you already covered this. No, I know I did. That's because that's what some of these arguments, you're going to see the same types of arguments, okay? we got about a minute. Let's go back to the passage that I want to burn into your brains by the end of this quarter. Go to Galatians chapter 3 one more time, and we'll finish with this one. Galatians 3, we're going to go to 26. So once again, the whole letter of Galatians is Paul saying, don't go back to the law of Moses. You don't have to be circumcised to be justified. You're justified by faith in Christ, not by the law of Moses, right? So you're justified by faith. And then in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith. So you become a son of God through faith. He's going to tell you how. Faith in Christ Jesus, that's where salvation is, in Christ. Verse 27, for as many of you as were, what? Baptized, and when you're baptized, what does that put you? Where? Into Christ. So we are saved by faith, but that faith has to be obedient to God's commands. So we're children of by faith, by the gospel, the system of faith, and whenever you're baptized, you are put into Christ. Your sins are washed away. Acts 22, you call in the name of the Lord. And baptism saves you through the blood of Jesus. That's what 1 Peter 3.21, all those says. Um, we'll go ahead and stop there. That's a good stopping place. Um, any comments? I, get, I left you probably 15 or 20 seconds. That's right. If she's referencing, some people will use uh, the passages like uh, the Philippian jailer and his household were baptized. And they'll say, see, it says his household, therefore that must imply children. Well, there are lots of households that have grown children that don't have babies, right? And what she was saying is, it said believe, okay, in there. Can babies believe? No. Babies are innocent. Jeremiah 19, 4 and 5 says they sacrifice their babies, their innocence, to the false gods. And it says then their children, right? Psalm 106, 36 and 37 talks about that too. Babies are innocent. They're sinless. Uh, thank you for your attention, and we'll see you next week.